Hello everybody, Kevin Hoyt, uh, Developer Advocate Lead with IBM here today to talk to you about um, pushing events or pushing notifications from a uh, from blockchain. Specifically, Hyperledger uh, Fabric is our blockchain implementation um, and um, we'll be using Hyperledger Composer as a, as a, a tool on top of that and uh, we'll explain, I'll explain why that is as we go along. So let's Let's not waste any time, let's get right to it. I actually open the uh, browser here to the Hyperledger Composer Playground. And in the Playground, uh, just if you're not familiar with the Playground, just to kind of orient to you really quickly, there's a, a list of different files you need to describe uh, your business network. And this is different things that are in your uh, business that, that apply to your business and, and your application and how you want to use uh, blockchain. In this case, I'm gonna. I've got a few things defined. Uh, I've got an asset here of stock, and uh, it's got a, some some properties that generally relate to stocks. So we're gonna do a little stock trading dashboard here, and um, so we have stock, and then we got a participant, so a trader, right? Someone who might own a, a an array of, of stocks and trade them as part of his portfolio. Uh, we're actually gonna use the trader in this specific demo. Um, he's actually part of the access control list, but we won't use the uh, the trader participant in this particular demonstration. Uh, I have two transactions here, one called trade and one called basket. And the only difference here is that trade is a singular trade. So I can send it a specific stock with a specific price and it will mark that up in the, uh, in the ledger. Uh, the other one is basket, which I can send it a lot of stocks um, and then a, an array, array of prices that relate to those stocks and it will go ahead and update those stocks in the ledger. So one is just singular, one is multiple. Each of those um, different transactions fires uh, a different event. Uh, the, the trade uh, transaction fires trade complete when it is done and it sends the latest details for that specific stock. And then basket complete actually sends an array of stock elements um, called lot. And, um, and these events here, this, this trade complete and, and basket complete, basket complete in, in particular, uh, as we'll see here in a minute, um, is uh, is what will be emitted from uh, Composer when the change is made to the ledger, and that event will be emitted over WebSocket, which is a really cool way to be able to notify other systems that live outside of the blockchain world uh, that still need to be updated. Uh, for example, in this case, a stock trading dashboard that needs to be aware of the prices that have been changed um, and, and be able to display that. So within the context of um, doing that there's some logic obviously behind it you can just have the model by itself this is the implementation for the uh, the singular stock trade and then down here i have uh, basket which is the implementation for the um, group or the bulk uh, stock trading uh, they're, they're almost identical um, so i'll just uh, the, the simpler one to, to kind of digest is the singular so uh, so, so we get this transaction it had a stock property if you recall the way we defined it in the model file uh, then it has a low, high, change, and last. So these are the values that would be modified based on the incoming price that we passed as well. So the stock and the price, right? So those two values coming in. I'm going to update the stock accordingly. We'll get the registry, uh, effectively where this where this uh, asset lives in uh, uh, in the ledger, and we'll get that registry. And then we'll go ahead and update it with update this specific stock, and that's that. But this is a promise, and so what we can do is after that we can go ahead and say, hey, after that's done. Uh, go ahead and generate a new event called a trade complete event, which is what we talked about earlier. And the trade event, trade complete event mentioned, as I mentioned in the uh, model file, has all those different properties that need to be filled out to relate to the latest stock value. And so go ahead and uh, put those in there from the uh, stock that came in and the changes that we made to the properties along the way. And then we'll go ahead and emit that event. And then what happens is, again, like I said, that event gets emitted off to uh, off to whatever's listening via, via WebSocket. So let's go ahead and just take a look at this in action real quick. I'll go over here to the test area. So in, this play, in the playground, this allows us to kind of test our business models. This, this is a great kind of, actually, I know it's called playground, but I actually use it as my primary development environment. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new, uh, oh, not a new, new, not a new trader, not a new participant, I need a new stock. Let's create a new stock. So the symbol for this stock is gonna be IBM which is International Business Machines. Great, we're gonna say the low is, well, let's just call it 100, we'll say the high is 200. I don't know what the actual prices are today. 
I'm just uh, making this easy for us to keep it in our head. Uh, we'll say the open is 110, and then the last thing that came in was 111, which is 111, which is a change of one, all right? So this is gonna put that into the ledger um, via the Composer APIs. And so we're gonna submit that. And indeed, now we can see that uh, this is, is part of the uh, the asset registry, as it were, the, the ledger for for uh, the stocks. Great, good, yay. Now let's go ahead and commit a transaction. And I just want to recap here. We, we, are, we opened it at 110, our last is 111, and our change is one, okay? So now let's submit a transaction. And we can choose from trade or basket. In this case, I'm just gonna, I only have one stock, so it doesn't make sense to do multiples, and trade is a little easier to, uh, as a singular entity, is, is easier to, to follow. So we'll say go ahead and hit trade, and then the stock. The stock we'll be uh, submitting a change to is IBM. And the price, we're gonna drop it down once. If you recall, it's 111. So we're gonna make it 110 again, and we'll go ahead and submit that. So that JavaScript logic that I showed you earlier in the transaction file, uh, the logic file is uh, is gone ahead and executed, and we actually see here in the uh, historian of all the different things that have happened on the ledger. Uh, in this specific case, we can see the transaction itself with a price of 110 for the stock of IBM. And you'll notice it also it, it emitted that event. So the events here, we'll go ahead and expand the detail. Uh, we can see that IBM, low, high, it opened at 1110, its last is 1110, which is what we just submitted via the transaction, and it's uh, then changed by one. All right, cool. Uh, and just to show this off, we'll come back here to the stock listing in the registry, take a look at it, and indeed, right, we do have that change to take place. So that's good. Now I wanna call out that we could've just clicked the edit button, right? We could say, hey, edit, hey. Uh, and then we'll say, okay, the last is, uh, 111, which is up again by one, and we'll go ahead and update that. Now, yay, okay, so that changes it too. What's the difference? Why would you go through all the work of having a transaction defined for it to manipulate it in the transaction when you could just edit it, right? Uh, in this case, in line, or as we'll see in a minute via a REST API call. The reason is because it, when you edit something directly like this, it doesn't actually emit any events. If we go back to the transactions, we'll see here that we did actually change that value so we go here, and there's the transaction and the value we changed it to, but no events. So when you change it directly, there's no events get fired. And that may be useful for many cases, right? But in this case, it was a stock dashboard where I want to get notifications. I want to be able to uh, have an event that gets emitted. And so the transactions, because I can have that custom logic in there, then goes ahead and gives me the ability to emit events based on any changes I might make to that stock record, right? So. Uh, two very different worlds. Now, I've actually gone ahead, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, I'll revisit that here in just a minute. So now, I've got this uh, all tested, and it works great, everything looks good, uh, if you will. And then I went ahead and uh, just exported that, and it, and it gave me uh, an archive file we call a banana file, it's a .bna, uh, I think that's for business network application. So I got my banana file, and uh, which is just a zip file, just an R straight up, traditional zip archive, we call it banana uh, because of the BNA, okay. So um, so I got the banana file and then I deployed it locally to uh, my, my Hyperledger Fabric instance, my blockchain instance, running locally on my machine. And then I used the Hyperledger Composer project. So this is the playground, but there are other parts and pieces that go with this. For example, there's a Node SDK uh, and it also gives you a CLI to do a lot of this stuff. For example, like sub submit this banana file uh, as a composer file to uh, Hyperledger Fabric, right? And things like, and set it up right, um, and so on. Uh, hides all those, the CLI hides all those details for us. The CLI also gives us the ability then to uh, deploy, the, once we deploy the file, the CLI also gives us the ability to run a REST server. And that's actually the second tab I have here. So this is, you see localhost 3000 in the Explorer. And we can come in here and uh, we have all the different uh, uh, things we might want to do via REST API to those stocks. Um, and in fact, I actually have already pre-populated this data, so we'll go ahead and try it out. And here's the response to the git. And you can see I have a, an array of stocks already present in the, uh, in the ledger, just waiting for us to, to work with. Now, what I could do, 
and I want to call this out again. I talked about this just a minute ago and call it out again. So I could come in here and say, hey, you know what? I want to change value of stock. So I could come in here and say, you know what? We're going to take uh, the stock. It's the symbol, right, IBM. And uh, this, the, the name string, uh, right, was, uh, was International Business, Business Machines. International Business Machines. And uh, the low, right, 100. And the high of, and again, you, would have, you wouldn't have to put all these in, I guess, if you don't want to change it. I'm just kind of doing it for being thorough. So it opened at 100. Oh, let's say the low was 110. The last is, right. So I can go ahead and submit these values, but this is, this is equivalent to clicking that little edit button and making the change directly. And I won't get any event off of that. It's just exposing that API raw. If I want to actually get an event off of the fact that it changed and something come off for your WebSocket, what I need to do is hit the transactions. And so we can see here in the Swagger API, two different uh, exposures, uh, one for basket, one for trade. And so you know, earlier we did the trade as an example. I come here, I can post a trade, and I, I can give it the uh, the appropriate details, right? What what stock I'm going to be uh, worried about and the price that it came in at, right? And then I can submit that, and that will invoke that custom logic, that transaction logic that will emit the event that actually shows up on the uh, uh, via WebSocket. All right, so we've got all this deployed locally, tested locally, works great locally. Um, and, uh, and now time to build a web UI. So this is our web UI. This is our, uh, our stock trading uh, dashboard, as it were. And uh, I've, I've gone ahead and load up the records from the blockchain, uh, and I can see them here, loaded 20 records. Let me actually just refresh it here. It looks like my web socket closed, so there we go. So we got uh, 20 records, and the, it's listening. Uh, the web application has used WebSocket to go ahead and listen for any changes. Now. I'm going to go ahead and go into a, run a Python script that starts firing off changes. Now, in this case, it's actually going to use the basket um, a transaction. And so it's going to be a bulk change uh, of a random number of records with random changes all, all at once, uh, about once a second. So let's go ahead and, and execute that. And so now we can start seeing we've got updating 14 records, updating 10. So this is just a random number of stocks. And you can see the, uh, the stocks that change. They, they kind of blink uh, blue for a second as, as the change comes in, and then fade off. And in fact, the, the charts too, if you look at the charts as the, the values come in, um, will also change as well. So this is just listening via WebSocket. And again, what's happening is the Python is using that REST API that we saw exposed by a composer, submitting a bulk change to the stock prices. And because we're doing that via transaction, we then have the ability to write the logic to emit a custom event. So that custom event comes out and we can see our stocks getting changed here. And uh, that is how we can do uh, notifications, event notifications from blockchain. And this is, again, this is valuable for, for tertiary systems or secondary systems or what have you that, that aren't uh, necessarily um, part, of the, uh, part of the blockchain, don't need to be part of the blockchain even potentially, right? Uh, the example I like to give uh, in this case, for example, is if you have a, a car auction and you decide to, uh, you know, you have a, in a car auction, you have an asset that is a car and, it, and participants, which are people who are either buyers or sellers, right? And they're going to go ahead and move the, that asset of, of, as a, of a car from one person, one participant to the other. That's probably going to exchange, in this case, right, some traditional car auction that would, that would require some money. We would make some, some money transaction. That means the bank might need to be notified, right? We might have to have a third-party API that integrates with the bank API, authenticates, whatever the case may be. Uh, you might then additionally want a bill of sale, uh, something you can send, you know, either a receipt to the guy who sold it and a, and a new title or something, I don't know, right, to, to, the, to the guy who bought it, right? proof that he bought it for how much and things like that, that he might be able to use on his taxes or to get his title or his license plates or whatever. So uh, in that case, you might have another system like maybe an IoT connected printer that is listening for the, uh, the the bill of sale to be complete, right? And then it gets that event via WebSocket and goes ahead and prints it off and then somebody just has to come by and pick it up and mail it off, right? And heck, it might even just use uh, UPS uh, API to, uh, to to mail it or whatever the case may be, right? So there's all kinds of different third-party systems that can be integrated this way, uh, which is very, very valuable to still be able to have all the bona benefits of using a blockchain environment, uh, 
but also be able to have uh, third-party tertiary systems involved. All right, so there we go. That's uh, emitting uh, event notifications uh, from Hyperledger Composer uh, via Hyperledger or via Hyperledger Composer. Uh, so effectively, events from blockchain. Hope you enjoyed the video, and uh, we'll uh, talk to you soon.